I can't see you, but I, I know you're there, so, <laughs> you know, keep breathing, make a little noise. Um, thinking about abundance in life, um, you might assume that that's a, a broad and a expansive subject, and in some ways it is. But in other ways, understanding abundant life is really very, very simple. And I want to see if I can show that to you uh, this morning. From uh, a little look at history and then uh, a look at a familiar Apostle Peter, and we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But first, a little bit of history. Throughout the history of the church, there has been an issue that um, believers have dealt with. And that is, is there salvation forever? And how can they know they're saved? Now, I, I know that's historic, and it's also your experience at some point. You have asked yourself, how do I know that I'm secure? How do I know that? Am I, can I be sure? I mean, there are whole segments of, of the church, even historically, that say you can lose your salvation. So how do I know that I cannot lose my salvation? How do I know that I can be promised by God and count on that promise that I will persevere and endure in faith to the end. I need to know that. I need to know that my salvation is secure. Secondly, I need to know that my salvation is the real thing. It's one thing to believe that salvation is forever. It's another thing to believe that you have that salvation. Because there are many people who are going to show up at the time of judgment and say, Lord, we did this and we did that. And you know Matthew 7, and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So we need to understand that salvation is forever, and we need to understand that we possess that forever salvation. And for me, that is the foundation of all abundance in Christian living. If you're fearful that your salvation can be lost, or if you're fearful that you don't have that eternal salvation, that sucks all the abundance out of your life. On the other hand, if you understand that salvation is forever, and you understand that you possess that salvation, then the fountain of all blessings is open to you. I guess what I'm saying is, no matter how much abundance the Lord pours into spiritual blessing, if you don't know you're in the kingdom, then you're struggling to even be thankful for those blessings. This is nothing new. This has always been an issue. And it goes back, let's say, to Peter, for example. I, I'm sure Peter had intense moments of doubt about his spiritual condition. I mean, look, how many apostles heard Jesus look them in the eye and say, get behind me, Satan? And if the Lord ever came up to you and said, get behind me, Satan, you would question your salvation. And of course, we know he failed on so many occasions. He's, he's really a hair's breadth away from Judas, who was the son of perdition, hanged himself and went to hell forever. So we're going to learn some things from Peter who must have struggled with the reality of an eternal salvation and whether or not he actually possessed that. But let's jump from Peter to 1644. In 1644, at a place called Westminster Abbey in England, in a room called the Jerusalem Room, the greatest theological minds finest biblical scholars in England, the famous Puritans gathered with lords and common people to sort out theology. And that meeting lasted five years. Five years of intense study by the finest minds in terms of the kingdom of God. Five years of discussion to produce a document true to Scripture and true to the gospel. 
The leadership for those five years was basically wielded by 100 men that were called divines. People like Thomas Goodwin, James Usher, Lightfoot, Samuel Rutherford, Jeremiah Burroughs, and others among the Puritans. Five years after they began in 1649, they completed the most important and comprehensive Christian creed ever written called the Westminster Confession. Now, in that creed is a statement on the security of salvation. They choose the word perseverance to describe it. In a brief and unambiguous declaration, after five years of thought, the confession came out like this. Here's a quote. Chapter 17, section 1 of the Westminster Confession. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved Son, effectually called and sanctified by his Spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from a state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. That is their conclusion. And it's the right conclusion. Salvation is forever. And it may have never been stated more beautifully and more succinctly. Scripture is filled with promises about the eternality of salvation. In fact, a simple verse like John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Life everlasting is everlasting. We can go through all of those passages that remind us that salvation is forever. So the Westminster Confession accurately affirms that saving faith cannot and will not fail. It's really important to know that. I mean, that, that's the most important thing to know. Because if you fear your faith will fail, then that is the end of your ability to enjoy the abundance of blessing God has poured out because you're living on the brink of terror all the time because hell is a terrible place. Now, what does it mean that your faith cannot fail? Well, here's what the Westminster Confession also said, and I'm quoting from section 3. Nevertheless, though salvation is secure and forever, nevertheless, believers may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalence of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of their means of preservation fall into grievous sins, and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves." End quote. Well, we know from that that though salvation is secure, that doesn't mean you're perfect, does it? The writers of the Westminster Confession understood, let me say it again, that through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalence of corruption remaining in them and the neglect of their means of, of preservation fall into grievous sins. Grievous sins. By which they incur God's discipline, grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts. And that's the one I want to look at. You will forfeit the abundance of the Christian life. Even though you are a possessor of an eternal salvation, if you follow the pathway of sin, security is one thing. Assurance is another. 
And I'm convinced that for a Christian to enjoy the, the abundance of God's blessing, you have to understand security, that is that salvation is forever, and two, assurance that you possess that salvation. And this is nothing new. I hear this all the time. People come to me and I, I'm often answering questions wherever I go to speak, and one of the common, common kind of heart cries that I hear from people young and old is, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm afraid I'm not saved. Uh, how, do I, how, do I, how do I know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven? If you don't know that, then you forfeit all the comforts, as the Westminster Confession said. You can't relish being blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus unless you know you're in Christ Jesus. So all abundance in our lives is tied to the reality of our salvation, which has to be a reality not only in God's mind, but in ours. And so the, the authors understood that this is very, very foundational to Christian life and experience. The doctrine of perseverance is this, that the faith and the life that is from God is a permanent gift of grace. And that's the operative word. You didn't earn it, so you can't forfeit it by something you did. It's a permanent gift of grace given by sovereign will and eternal. That, that is the doctrine of perseverance, that the life that is from God is a permanent gift of grace by sovereign will inseparable from eternal life. We hear that in Romans chapter 8, that whom he chose, he justified, and whom he justifies, he sanctifies, and whom he sanctifies, he glorifies. We hear that in John 6, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I'll lose none of them, but raise him up at the last day. Any idea of salvation that denies its eternality is a complete distortion of the truth. You can't earn it by what you do, and you can't forfeit it by what you do. It is forever. Now, there are many texts in the Scripture that we could look at with regard to that, but I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, let's follow up with Peter. A lot can be said about this. But Peter provides for us a really wonderful, wonderful illustration. Because of what I said a few minutes ago, that, you know, he was eyeball to eyeball with Jesus, and Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. And our Lord unfolded that a little bit in Luke 22, 31 and 32, when he said, Satan has desired to sift you. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Satan was after Peter. He was the leader. But the Lord was praying for him. And what that tells us is that salvation is secure, not because we hold on to it, but because the Lord holds on to us. He ever lives to make intercession for those who are his. He intercedes for us to secure us in that eternal life. I love that statement. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. I like that. That's the high priestly ministry of Jesus. The reason your faith won't fail is because he's interceding on behalf of that. And of course, he always prays according to the Father's will. So he always receives what he prays for. So th this is a starting point, and I think I want to expand a little bit on it by having you just look at this chapter in just kind of an overview way, but 1 Peter 1, 3. And let me read down to verse 9. 
And we're not going to take all the parts um, out of this and cover all of them, but I think you'll feel the power of this in just the reading of it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, again, nothing we have done to earn it, according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. This is all divine. He has, by his great mercy, caused us to be born again. It wasn't anything we did. He caused us. Only he can give life. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. And when we were born again, bound up in that birth is the reality of a living hope. What is a living hope? It's a hope that never what? Never dies. God, in his mercy, caused us to be born again, gave us new life, regeneration. And that new life is marked by a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. He rose and we will rise. He is the first fruits of that resurrection. So in that one verse, we find that all the aspects of salvation and its fullness and its eternality are stated. By mercy, he gave us life. It is a life that cannot die. It is the same life possessed by Jesus who rose from the dead and ever lives to make intercession for us. It doesn't end there. Verse 4. And not only did the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ by mercy cause us to be born again, but also, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance. In other words, you were saved to obtain an inheritance. Upon the point of salvation, you became adopted by God into his family, you became a child of God, and you have been granted an inheritance. What about that inheritance? Well, verse 4, it is imperishable. It is undefiled. It will not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. Amazing statements. Amazing. By mercy, we have been regenerated into life, and in that life is the hope of eternal resurrection and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and it's reserved in heaven for you. It's not generic. It's personal. It's personal. It's so personal that in the book of Revelation, we find out that the overcomers who are going to show up in heaven are going to have a name in each of them, an individual name that no one knows. It's a way of saying that we're not going to be just a mass of perfected saints. We're going to be individually known by the Lord, and he will pass out to us our personal inheritance. And then to, to add to that, Peter writes in verse 5, who are protected. We are protected, and consequently our inheritance is protected by the power of God. So your salvation is not in your hands. It's not in, in such loose condition that somebody could remove it from the Lord's hands. Because John 10 says, no one will ever snatch my sheep out of my hand. Because my father and I are greater than all. So we are protected by the power of God through faith. For and that I need to note just in a moment, through faith, that is the means that secures us for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You can't even define salvation unless you define it encompassing its final end, its final goal, its last aspect, which is glorification. 
whoever the Lord chose, he chose for eternal glory. Whoever he saved, he saved for eternal glory and reward. Now, having said all of that about the security and and viable promise of eternal salvation and the power of God which keeps you, he then in verse 6 adds something that is really important. In this you greatly rejoice. So you want to know where your joy is? You want to know where your abundant life comes from? It comes from the knowledge of the reality of your eternal salvation. No matter what happens in life around you, this is unassailable. And that's what it means, you know, to set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth, to live in the heavenlies, because you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, Ephesians 1. And if you live in the heavenlies, and that is in the sense that you literally build your life around that which is eternal, then you will draw up from the wells of divine blessing every possible abundant grace. When I look at the the experience of life after all these years, you have ups and downs, you have challenges and trials, but I can honestly say no matter what comes and what goes, and I've seen the range of it, there is a profound depth of joy in my heart. I can't understand people who are hostile or angry or bitter, no matter what goes on, because I'm literally overwhelmed by the spiritual blessings that continue to be poured out into my life, not due to anything I've done, but due to the grace and mercy of the Lord. I embrace them all as testimony that I belong to Him. And along the way, verse 6 adds, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So having said that salvation is forever does not mean that you're not going to face trials. As I just pointed out in the Westminster Confession, they understood that. Salvation is forever, but you can go through many, many trials and will and are doing that. And uh, that's where temptation comes and sin comes and failure and all of that. Even though you have, for a little while, if necessary, been distressed by various trials. Now listen to this. So that the proof of your faith What is the proof of your faith? What proves your faith is real? It's the trials. It's it's not really a challenge to uh, look at your faith and look at your life when everything goes well. You know, if, if if you're a straight A student, you got the girl you wanted, you scored 32 points at the basketball game, um, you're maybe liable to say to yourself, boy, I must be in God's kingdom. Look at all the good things going my way. But that's no test of your faith. Test of your faith is when you go 0 for 13 from 3. Test of your faith is when she dumps you. Test of your faith is when you fold and don't prepare and flunk the test. Test of your faith is when the doctor says, you know, we're very concerned about some lesions we see. We want to check and find out if they're cancer. The test of your faith is when uh, your best friend betrays you. The test of your faith is when your parents divorce and your heart is broken and you don't know what the future is going to look like. That's the test of your faith. Can it survive? Can it endure? If it's the real thing, it will. That's exactly what it says. The proof of your faith is trials. So we're not saying that we live in some kind of euphoria. Oh, I have a permanent, everlasting, eternal salvation, and it's all joy, joy, and nothing but that. No, life is filled with sorrow. I I think in, in the generation in which we live in, people assume they shouldn't have trouble. I mean, just as a general world viewpoint. People think they shouldn't have any trouble. They, they think um, 
somehow their, um, their um, I guess, sense of self-promotion elevates them above the hoi polloi, and they don't think they should have trouble. And if you bring them trouble, this is some alien thing. Well, that's absurd. Job says, as the sparks fly upward, so is man born for trouble. But as a Christian, you need to understand that trouble is where you find your faith being tested. So when you get the bad news, and when it mounts up and escalates, what's your attitude toward the Lord? Are you still praising Him? Are you, are you still embracing the abundance of blessings that are yours? This is the proof of your faith. See, faith is the means by which you are secured. So let me make that clear. You're not secure whether you believe or not. You're secure by the very faith that God has given you which cannot fail. You can't fail because your faith can't fail. I think the best testimony to that is probably Job. And Job had lost everything, and he makes this amazing statement, though he slay me. I mean, he's taken everything, children, family, wealth, possessions, health. Though he slay me, speaking of God, I will trust him. What a test. You read the book of Job. Satan came to God and said, I want to tear that man down. I'll prove to you the only reason he is so faithful to you is because you bless him. Stop blessing him and watch his faith fail. And God, understanding the nature of the faith which he himself gave Job, said, have at it. Go at him, Satan. And God allowed Satan to do to Job, literally, one man, what may not have happened to the whole community collectively over the years. Devastation at every level. And he says, if he kills me, I'll trust him. Why? Because that's natural? No, that's unnatural. That's not human faith. That's the faith that saves. That's saving faith, which is from above. So your faith is secured doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials. What it does mean is that through those trials, your faith being tested will prove to be the real thing. How important is that? Look at verse 7. It's more precious than gold. Now, the Bible says that a few times. The Bible says that a few times. Job says that, that wisdom, Job 28, is more precious than gold. It's a, it's a divine way of elevating something above everything else. Wisdom is more precious than gold. Psalm 19 says, Lord, your words, your revelation, Scripture, more precious than gold. And here is another time when that same phrase is used. What is more precious than gold? Proof that your faith is real. That's more precious than gold. Because if your faith is proven real, that is the greatest gift that you could ever be given because it allows you then to rejoice in all the blessings that belong to those who are genuinely Christ's. Your ability to grasp and enjoy the fulfilling abundance of divine blessing in your life to live abundantly is tied to the fact that you know you are saved. You fear no hell in the future. You fear no defection in your own heart. Why? Because your faith will not fail. It's not a human faith. It's the faith that is the gift of God. It's a saving faith that lasts. Even though, verse 7 says, tested by fire. And that's to point out the fact that the test can be very severe. Through those, and I love this again, even though you go through tests that are fiery, 
you will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You think about Job. And through the midst of all of that, he was praising God. At the end of it all, at the end of the book of Job, he says, you know, I used to think I knew you. I heard of you with the hearing of mine ear. But now my eye sees you and I repent in dust and ashes. I see you in a new way. And through all of this, I have a new appreciation for you that breaks my heart and causes me to repent. Virtue, holiness, came out of that severe trial. And Job knew that, and he says this, though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God. I'll be there at the end. I'll be there in heaven. I'll be there at the glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then verse 8, And though you have not seen him, you love him. This, um, this is sort of the overarching reality. Your faith holds on. Why? Because you love Christ. What is it that 1 Corinthians says about non-Christians? They don't love Christ. What does it say about Christians? They love Christ. That's the distinguishing mark. When we're going through those trials... Do we turn on him? Do we reject him? Do we resent him? Do we hate him? That's what false Christians do. That's what you're watching in so-called Christian deconstruction. People who claim to be Christians and all of a sudden deny the faith and uh, post their, their denial. They are happy, self-satisfied, smug, narcissistic apostates. And what they reveal is that they never loved Christ. What happens to the true believer is when the true believer goes through trials, the love is not diminished. The love is not diminished. Though you don't see him, you love him. And then just continuing, he says, though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And those who do that are the ones who will obtain the outcome of their faith, the salvation of their souls, the final salvation aspect, meaning glory. So is salvation permanent? Is it for real? That it's going to be everlasting? Yes, it is. And I don't know a better passage than what we've just looked at to affirm that. And should you think for a moment that if some point in your life all you can feel coming at you is trial after trial after trial, disappointment, struggle with sin, failure, all of that, certainly as Peter did, that somehow this is an evidence that you're not a true Christian, that your salvation has maybe been forfeited? No, it's just the opposite. When you go through those kinds of times and your faith does not fail, that is the proof of its eternal character. So embrace the trial. Embrace the trial. Even the trial by fire because you've just been given the most precious gift possible. Here's the most precious gift you could have as a Christian, to know your salvation is forever, right? You can rest in that. And you receive that with great joy, inexpressible and full of glory, because you know the final end, the outcome of your salvation. So Peter is saying salvation is forever and even the difficult things that come our way in life don't chip away at that salvation or our understanding of its eternality. Rather, when you go through those things and your faith doesn't fail, you know it's the real thing. It stood the test. 
First John 2 says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out from us that it might be made manifest they never were of us. That's what happens to all these quote-unquote hashtag ex-evangelicals. All the um, deconstructed Christians who now deny the faith they once professed. Their faith was not the real thing because the real thing lasts. And they all say, well, I went through this and that and the other. and I began to realize that I didn't believe in Christianity anymore. That is the unmasking of a false Christian because a true Christian would find joy in the trial because the proof of the faith that he possesses is manifest in the trial. And that's more precious than gold to know you're saved and your salvation is for real. Now turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter is dealing with people who are having trials, struggling. They are saints that are scattered. There is persecution going on. They're suffering a lot of things. Peter talks a lot about suffering. They suffer from persecution. They suffer from the uh, assaults and attacks of false teachers and they suffer certain deprivations in life. So he's back at this issue of salvation again, wanting to encourage them. Now, in the beginning of the first epistle, he demonstrated that our salvation is forever, and the forever nature of our salvation is basically sustained by two things, a faith that cannot die and the intercessory work of Christ as our great high priest. You can read about that in John 17. But then we go from understanding that our salvation is real to enjoying the fact that we have that salvation. Okay, salvation's real. How do I know I have it? How do I know I have it? Well, as we just saw, trials and tests that cause you to love the Lord more, that become to you precious experiences, more valuable than gold, because they assure you of faith, is Peter's answer in the first epistle. But look what he does in 2 Peter. If you want to enjoy the abundance of the Christian life, here is again some instruction that is so important. Go, go to verse 2 of, verse, of 2 Peter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So again, he's affirming the fact that divine power has deposited for us and continues to do so everything pertaining to life and godliness because we have the true knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. And then in verse 4, he says, By these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Again, he's, he's saying what he said in 1 Peter, just in a different way. Divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We who possess the true knowledge of the Lord, we have been given precious, magnificent promises. We have become partakers of the divine nature. We have escaped ultimately the corruption that is in the world by lust. All of this is a reiteration of the nature of our salvation. But then in verse 5, he comes to the second question. How do I know that that salvation, that eternal salvation, is mine, that I possess it. Now follow his thought in verse 5. Now for this very reason also, I, I want to help you. Applying all diligence. You, you can't just 
stand and expect that the assurance of your salvation is going to sort of fall out of heaven. Your salvation is secure, that's clear from Scripture, but assurance of it is another thing. So how do you become sure that the salvation described here is what you possess? How do you know you are one who's escaped the corruption of the world? How do you know you are one who has been given all things pertaining to life and godliness? How do you know this? All right, verse 5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence. This is going to, this is going to call for a response by every one of us. In your faith, in your faith, the, the gift of faith that God gave you, Supply moral excellence. There's no need to explain that. It's exactly what it says. Here's your responsibility. Be morally excellent. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. That would be deep knowledge of things divine. And verse 6, in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Th these are all the imperatives. Salvation is described by the indicatives. These are the imperatives. Supply moral excellence, knowledge, which means a deep, true spiritual knowledge, self-control, perseverance or endurance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And then verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If this is what you see in your life, you see moral excellence, the love of true knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, kindness, love. If you see those things, then you are not useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 9, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So, a person who possesses the true and eternal salvation can find himself in a condition where he is useless, where he is unfruitful, and where he becomes blind or short-sighted with regard to his own salvation. You can't lose your salvation, but you can forfeit the assurance of it. And so in verse 10 he says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling. Make certain about his calling, meaning his call to salvation, the effectual call. Make certain his choosing you. Be sure you're elect and divinely called. Now, how can you be sure? As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble with regard to that matter of assurance. In this way, verse 11, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be, and here's our word, abundantly supplied to you. You want abundant life? Then understand your salvation is for real. Demonstrate that you possess that salvation by spiritual virtues, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, patience, could be that, Godliness, kindness, and love. And where you see those things, you are certain 
of your calling and God's choosing you. And that way, you can go down the path all the way to the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, embracing the abundance of divine blessing. Our Father, we thank you for your, your truth. It's, it's what we live by, what we long for, what we cherish and what we need. It has no equal. It is more precious than gold. Seal the truth to our hearts, we pray for your glory. Amen.